Uh, thank you for coming to the session. Good to see a lot of people attending. Uh, so I'm Christopher Davey. I'm VP and General Manager for WSO2 Integration and API Management Software. So look after the API Manager, Microintegrator, and <coughs> APK, which launched last year. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is you've seen some stuff from Sanjeeva and the, um, the other talks around what we've been doing, some of the AI things. We've just did some releases, haven't got uh, a lot of time. So um, I'm just going to try and give you a heads up on to the sort of things we're looking for in the future, where we're going to go, uh, and what our sort of focus areas are. And after the session, obviously, looking for any sort of feedback from you guys as well, because we like to make sure we know what our, our customers are looking for and see what we can do in our roadmap for that. So um, <clears throat> for those of you that, that don't know, most of you probably do, is I used to be a WC2 customer. So I joined WC2 six and a half years ago. Uh, before that, I worked for uh, UK government and deployed a couple of WC2 platforms, API management and integration. Um, and they kindly employed me afterwards, which was great. Um, so these are some of the things that I was trying to do uh, with my platform back then. So one of the key, uh, the key concerns when I was deploying sort of an API management platform was trying to get data access. That's the, that's the main thing. At the end of the day, APIs, you're throwing data around, you're giving access to data. What we were trying to do with the platform is give a single point of truth. So without using a complex MDM platform, we wanted one API, one set of data, where we could get information about our citizens <coughs> and services um, without, um, without very sort of complex interactions and sort of standardize that. Um, we used to use uh, a lot of ETL tools and copy data for data protection. Absolutely hate that. We had you know, DMZs running operational data stores versus our main data store. Synchronization, ETL processes get very complex. So we wanted to then access this data in more real time, more simply, obviously still maintain the security. Um, and we had some very complex integration architectures. So multi-layer pub sub architectures, um, you know, one of the systems was over six server hops to get to the data and get back to the user, which was, was crazy. We wanted to uh, give a consistent interface for application developers. So this was when we were doing our digital transformation. Um, we wanted to really accelerate how we develop digital services. We used to take 12 months to deploy new services. Uh, we wanted to be able to create the digital services, the citizen-facing services, a lot quicker. Uh, to do that, they needed <coughs> APIs to access the data quickly so that they could innovate and rapidly compose the services and systems on top. Uh, wanted them to sort of find what they needed easily. Um, so <coughs> we tended to use our development wiki site for this, which was a mistake. We didn't utilize the power of the WC2 developer portal. Um, but, um, you know, uh, but that sort of worked to an extent, but wasn't uh, ideal. And, you know, we didn't initially govern the uh, APIs, the consumers didn't have the right setup, so we weren't. We had a, um, <coughs> uh, uh, an issue where we were exposing system and service information that we didn't necessarily need to, because we were just directly exposing the API. So design governance and stuff was also a bit of a challenge. And we were providing a center of excellence. So central API integration development team. We created great reusable plat patterns. We had great agile delivery of APIs and integrations. And you know, having that platform, as we've been talking about, was great. Uh, but it took a long time, and it cost a shit ton of money <laughs> to get it done. You know? But when it was done, it was great. It really worked. And the team was in high demand. You know? When I left, we had over 100. Uh, API and integration developers, um, but we were still creating a bottleneck with that sort of centralized approach. And always security, can't forget security. It's a key concern. Security architects are always giving me, always giving me a hard time. I hope I've got no security architects here today. Don't want to upset anyone. <laughs> but, um, you know, we needed better control of, you know, uh, who the end user was accessing the data. Uh, wanted to use, obviously, the the key security standards, and it had an approach of defense in depth. So through all the layers of the architecture, we need to make sure every interaction was secure. 
So these are sort of the key concerns that I was building platforms for um, a number of years ago now. But um, from being with WC2 for six years, it's, I've been looking at what do I see our customers and prospects caring about now. No-brainer, security is still a massive concern and even more, um, uh, uh, um, more complex now. So having the uh, best right level of security, managing security versus usability, you know, the most secure system in the world is a computer that's buried, I think, 12 feet deep underground um, because then you can't even get the electromagnetic uh, uh, connections from it but obviously completely unusable, useless for the business. So using the right standards, um, but there's also wider concerns around things like your standard authorization, uh, authentication, you know, um, which is wider than the platform as rail. There's a lot more uh, security concerns around social engineering and far more sophisticated attacks that aren't just about cracking and stealing credentials. So it, these are all sort of top of mind for a lot of uh, people. Um, also, one thing I sort of ca I've come across a couple of times is sort of more business logic, operational vulnerabilities. So, although the API might be secure, the way the API has been designed has led to people being able to exploit the API in ways it wasn't intended. Now, very, very difficult to sort of identify and protect against, but something that's got to be top of mind when you're designing APIs, you've got to think a little bit more widely about how they could be used to potentially abuse the service, not necessarily just get hacked. And sort of new, you know, with the new protocols, new, new approaches, um, you've got to improve this, the security. So GraphQL obviously has new areas you need to protect against. You know, rate limiting is a different beast when you're talking about GraphQL because you're retrieving lots of different data and you can do sort of recursive calls and things, which means that traditional approaches um, Aren't, uh, aren't as effective. Um, you still need them, but you need additional stuff on top. And sort of the identity access management, customer identity access management, B2B federation, I'm sure if you attend any of uh, uh, the IAM um, uh, sessions, you'll hear more about that. But obviously, that's critical these days. Who's accessing it? Who's authorized to see it? Um, and that's more and more important, especially with more citizen-based services and open data and, and things like that these days. So one of the key things I think <coughs> has changed is the business of APIs. You know, when I was first doing it, this was just exposing data and services to, uh, to customers, uh, enabling app, uh, guys to develop applications. But um, this isn't just a technical interface anymore, it's key to the, the business model, we've heard a lot about it uh, today. They're key to delivering business value. You know, you've got to have them there so that the, your engineers can build the services you need. And <clears throat> one of the key things is everything we do in this sort of space is to deliver some sort of business value. You know, the technology is great, and I love playing around with tech, but ultimately, you know, having an API platform, having an internal developer platform, doesn't achieve anything unless you're building business value services on top of that. So APIs are becoming more key core to the business. Uh, they're exposing new business models where data you previously had can now be utilized in new ways. It can be monetized. You can embed your services into partner data flows. We see that a lot in payment systems with the likes of PayPal, Klarna, et cetera. Um, and you need to not just expose your APIs and allow people to uh, access them, you need to market them and sell them and actually try and get people to buy and subscribe to your APIs. And from a product in, with that in mind, where you're actually deriving business value, you're um, <clears throat> in implementing new business models, time to market is far more important. Uh, developers are expensive, so you want to make sure you're getting the best use out of them. And you want to make it easy for people that are coming to Get your APIs, you want to make it easy for them to consume, uh, both internally and externally. You know, you want your internal developers to be able to easily get what they need. You want any external consumers, partners, to be able to come and find what they need and uh, subscribe fast. So the other, <coughs> other um, element uh, that uh, I've seen more and more over the last few years is the scale's just getting bigger. Now, 
If you look back on previous con presentations, uh, even sort of 2018, which was the last one, we we're always talking about sort of API scale. And you know, back when I was doing it, we had about 300 APIs, and that was pretty big. Um, the governance wasn't great, so as I said, we probably didn't need 300, but we had them. Um, and, but it's not just the APIs you're creating, it's also the APIs you're using. You know, you're not um, just uh, creating APIs to expose, you're consuming APIs from SaaS services, from now AI, LLMs, etc. And all of that is a sort of a new scale to manage. And we're not talking about three, 400 APIs anymore. Uh, a lot of our customers now have got 1,000, got 2,000. Some of our customers are talking about 50,000 plus APIs. So the a, a need for governance at that scale, making sure you're doing the right thing, making sure you've got the right uh, uh, security, is becoming more and more critical. Um, so uh, with all sort of that in mind, these are the, what well, I'm gonna go through some of the areas that we're sort of looking to focus on uh, with the product in the future. So uh, along with, obviously we've got the platformless vision, et cetera, we're always trying to abstract that complexity. So when you're talking about getting things to market quicker, when you're talking about um, getting developers to be more efficient, it's always about abstracting that complexity, uh, both for creators, consumers, your IT teams, business, and you need to sort of simplify, automate, and sort of standardize. So some of the things that we're, we're working on now to simplify, uh, as you may or may not have seen with uh, API M 4.3 and APK 1.1, we've now got a centralized control plane. So whether you're a Kubernetes first API uh, development or a, a through the control plane developing your APIs, you've got an option to uh, use a centralized control plane, which means that both APK and APIM gateways have access to all of the um, capabilities, the central uh, discovery and subscription, the developer portal, the administration. Uh, so you've got all of that capability as well. While you can then decide whether you need the sort of the standard gateway to meet your needs or the APK Kubernetes native approach uh, fits your organization's uh, needs more. Obviously, productivity enhancement is a big uh, thing we're focusing on. Uh, Sanjeeva pointed out a couple of the AI enhancements we've done around API testing. And uh, uh, the, he didn't mention it, but the screenshot was behind of an API marketplace assistant. So going back to that point of being able to discover and use APIs quickly, if you're coming to a portal, you want to find the API you want fast. Now, you can scroll and search, and you can use tags, and that's great, and that helps. But when you've got 1,000 or 2,000 or more, that becomes very, very tricky. So using AI in the marketplace search, where you can ask for APIs that do particular functions, you can get them to compare capabilities uh, of those APIs and what they manipulate, all through natural language interface. So you don't necessarily have to straight away dive into looking at the open API specification, figure out what they do, what data objects they have you can get <clears throat> a lot of information just by using the natural language. So making that experience a lot faster, a lot easier, both for your internal developers and any partners, consumers you want out there. And then when they found one, they can easily see what it can do by testing uh, with natural language as well. So you can get that initial evaluation testing. As we said, it's you know still early days for AI in this space, so you've got to be a little bit cautious how you use this in production, but testing evaluation, it's a great way of being able to see what can the API do. You can use the chat to invoke all of the operations and see what the response are, responses are and the payloads, et cetera. It will generate data. You can ask it to call multiple APIs to achieve a use case, and it will figure it out and call those APIs. And you can see that happening far quicker than, as I said, going into the open API spec, crafting it in your VS code, and then cutting and pasting it to the test tool and stuff, it, you know. Uh, so that's really sort of key on both sort of internal, external uh, to enhance productivity. This is just the first stage of the sort of AI assistant in API. Obviously, we've <coughs> we will leverage both uh, this sort of stuff, both in Corio and our open source platforms as well. Uh, one of the other things that we're going to be looking at in the future is, you know, that selling your API. So, as I said, being able to easily find and consume them is, is part of that. But having that portal be more of a marketplace where you can actually uh, sell, that's also something that we're going to fo focus on in the future. 
and you know, you've almost got a buyer's journey there. You know, not quite Amazon, but you want someone to come along, look at your API, I think that's going to do what I need it to do. Click the buy it now, not leave it sitting in a, a, an abandoned basket. Other areas to simplify, um, I think um, Isabel talked a lot about this uh, in the panel, and I'm a firm believer that is that API governance, especially around design and security. Um, the shifting left of being able to identify any issues um, before you put something live is critical. Um, you know, making sure that the right policies are enforced, making sure that you're using the right security standards, but also just getting visibility of what you are using. So governance from a point of view of looking at um, <clears throat> you know, better dashboards for stakeholder visibility, understanding your API estate a lot easier. And again, this is one of the drivers from the scale perspective. That's going to get more and more important the more APIs and the more complexity you've got in that space. So that's an area we're looking at um, to, in the future and will be coming in later versions. Um, and also, and obviously AI will play a part in those sort of governance things as well. Um, another thing we're looking at on AI, which is in development at the moment, is around looking at your API state and being able to suggest uh, changes or enhancements based on the sort of uh, what data, data models you're exposing to the world, be able to visualize that. You know, you've got a lot of capabilities there to be able to get a better grip of what you're doing, what you're exposing to your customers. Couple that with uh, your usage data, who's using what, who's finding what most valuable, um, can really help drive your sort of API strategy and your, your business value forward. So automation uh, is key. Uh, AI ops is the new latest label. I love labels, you know, just labeling everything. And, but ultimately, this is just sort of applying core DevOps principles to APIs as well. So you want to automate those error-prone tasks, remove human intervention where it's not necessary, uh, and deliver this with full source control pipelines to test, deploy, et cetera. So, you know, you've got a lot of those capabilities now with the product, with the CLI uh, and the APIs that we've integrated in the product to, to help, um, uh, help integrate your sort of API uh, deployment and testing uh, within the pipeline. But we're looking to uh, always sort of improve that scope, make it a lot easier um, to sort of manage and control those APIs. And also on the sort of the runtime, so... This is one of the key areas uh, that we've sort of introduced uh, APK for, is more and more people are running within Kubernetes. So Kubernetes always has a well-defined declarative approach to deploying and managing services within its environment. APK just extends that seamlessly, adds um, elements to enable full lifecycle API management, not just sort of the basic ingress controlling. Um, and really makes it easier to adopt for those that are uh, familiar in that environment and already using a key, uh, a core sort of Kubernetes approach to sort of managing their, their services. <clears throat> and sort of standardization as well. You know, we've already got lots of standards and protocols as they develop. We'll obviously keep on top of those. Um, and we've also got regulatory industry standards. Um, we've pulled all of our sort of uh, key accelerators and extension points for uh, PSD2 and FAPI and FIRE into the core product. It's just part of the standard subscription now. Makes it a lot easier for people to just go and build uh, solutions that meet any regulatory standards that come up in various, um, <clears throat> various industries. Uh, there is a birds of the feather talk about open data and smart data later on, which I'll be in. If you're interested in that sort of area, we'll sort of dig more uh, into that later. And for Kubernetes, we now have the gateway API specification. So that's great for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, for any uh, adoption of gateways within that space uh, that um, adhere to the standard, it means operating and federating those becomes a lot easier. So the trouble with sort of federating gateways at the moment, if you're trying to uh, control and manage an AWS gateway and a WC2 gateway and a Tong gateway, they're all different interfaces, different CLIs, different patterns. Very difficult to do, possible, but hard to maintain. And it's a very brittle uh, approach as well. 
someone changes the specification and suddenly your system doesn't work anymore. With the sort of advent of the API specification within Kubernetes, that's going to mean that the core capabilities in that space are going to be standardized. Anyone that supports it means that you can federate and operate different gateways a lot uh, easier. Um, <coughs> obviously, it needs extensions. You can see in the uh, uh, diagram up front, if you want more details, I say just grab some of us later. Um, you know, uh, the team have obviously extended the specification to handle additional elements that give the capabilities for full lifecycle cycle layer management. But the standard's going to involve, we're working with the, um, the working groups, et cetera, to look at how to evolve that standard to make sure that um, we're on top of that and we evolve uh, as it does. So that's a sort of a, a whistle-stop tour of um, what we are looking at and how we're uh, planning to um, uh, evolve the product in the future. As I said, feel free to grab me or any of the team if you've got any uh, uh, questions or anything about that. Um, but um, anyone got any queries or questions now? <laughs> 